Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff, and welcome to the Lab Test 2 Review. So I placed the subtitle there being Evolutionary Change, Genetics, and Chi-Square. And off to the side of the screen, there is a calculator, but for right now, we don't need the calculator. So let's begin. Evolution class, as defined in the chapter, just to ensure that you remember that evolution occurs in populations. It is populations that, that evolve and not individuals. So if I were to just encircle one of these individuals here, it's not that individual that evolves. It's the entire population. So we don't evolve, meaning you yourself or the person sitting next to you. It's going to be the entire population. So let's get to the ways in which we get to evolution. So this does take us to population genetics. And here, of course, this is just looking at the variation, that variability in genetics in that population and those forces acting upon it. So I hope that you review this. And of course, let's get to the meat and the potatoes of this lecture. So in this, the population gene pool, it just includes all of the alleles for every locus. So all alleles, for all loci. And of course, that's referring to the location of a gene on a chromosome. So of course, us being, being diploid, we have two alleles per locus. And of course, depending upon what gene or what character it is, there may, of course, be a number of alleles at differing loci that, of course, account for that, such as with skin color, several different alleles at several loci. And of course, it's because of that that it's not just black and white, meaning it's continuous variation as opposed to being, of course, with discrete characters, being this or that, such as the presence of a widow's peak or, of course, no peak. So let's get on into things such as genotype, phenotype, and a little frequencies, which you all should know a great deal about. So for review, let's check it out. So as far as genotypes are concerned, here on the left-hand side, they are listed. So we have two dominant A's, and of course, that would make that homozygous dominant. And of course, we have one dominant A and one recessive A, and that would be heterozygous. And then we have, of course, two recessive A's, and that would be homozygous recessive. So in the center there, that gives you that observed number of individuals. So of course, overall, you could say that little n or big n, either the two that you like to use class, is 1,000 in total. And then you have the breakdown class of the number of individuals within that population. And then of course, you have genotype frequency for each of those three different genotypes. So this ought to be nothing new, and I'll get to how to I'll get to how we discern the number of those. I guess I'll just start right now. And I'm saying the frequency for each genotype, discerning such there. So let's do that now. And if you have the paper and pencil, let's begin. So at least in this case, at least in this case, and yes, I do have paper. Yes, your instructor has paper. And usually I use a pencil, but so that you all can see things a lot better, I am using a black pen today. So let's start this off. Just regular old genotype frequency. So here I'll write down the number 90 because there are 90 individuals that are almost like a recessive. The total number is 1,000. So you could just write 90 divided by 1,000, and I guess to help you even more so than that, let's just go and say that equals, and I don't know if you have a calculator there, but of course I have one here for you. So I'll type in 90 divided by 1,000, it equals 0 0.09. And to the left of all of it, I'll just write down homozygous recessive, as in two recessive A's, equal 90 divided by 1,000, and that's 0 0.09. So, of course, the same can be the case for the others of which. So, of course, it's 490 divided by 4,000. I'm sorry, 490 divided by 1,000. And that would be for homozygous dominant. So, to the left of which, I'll write homos like it's dominant, and I'll clear what's there and write down, type in 490 divided by 1,000 equals 0 0.49. And 
And lastly, it is 420, which is heterozygous, divided by 1,000. And just make sure out to the left, you have an A that is dominant and an A that, res that is recessive for heterozygosity. And then, of course, do the math. So that's 420 divided by 1,000. And there we go, 0 0.42. Though it's given, I recommend you write this down as I'm writing this down because this will help you in your test. So you can kind of see there what I've done here, just as you see on the screen. I recommend you ask questions as you, of course, have that question because I say there's never a need to wait to ask a question. So given this much, I'll continue on. So it now gets to the proportion of alleles and in this case, it's referring to the phenotypic frequency. So when I get to phenotypic frequency, and I'm going to write backwards here, genotype frequency, because we just wrote out the genotype frequencies. So I just wrote down genotype frequency at the top. And here it just says phenotypically, that's what you see. And with that, of course, it just says that it's going to be 910. And if you're wondering why it says 910, so let's just type in 490 plus 420. And that is how that 910 was, of course. I guess you say calculate it. So to the right-hand side of this, I'm going to write phenotype frequency. And given that 9 out of 10, for those dominant individuals, divided by our total, which is 1,000, equals... 0 0.91 and then of course we have the recessive which is 90 divided by 1000 giving us 0 0.09 I'll move my calculator out of your way to ensure that you kind of understand what I'm getting at. So the reason I'm doing this part, because this is not genotype frequency. This is those that are phenotypic, such as mid-digital hair, or even, I guess I'll say, detached earlobes, meaning phenotypically what's seen is that there were 910 individuals because you had to add together, of course, those that were homozygous dominant and those that were heterozygous, at least in the case, of course, complete dominance. So I hope this was a pretty good review. So let's get to other parts of this and we'll finish this lecture up pretty soon. So now on to allele frequency. So this just deals with those individual alleles and we're not going to do any calculating here. But just keep in mind this is the actual allele and just keep in mind that it takes two alleles to of course create that genotype and it takes a genotype to of course get to some phenotype. So I'm not going to go through how to calculate this necessarily because I think that you all can. But of course, the same thing. You take 1,400 and of course divided by 2,000 respectively, of course, would be 600 divided by 2,000 to get that 0 0.7 and that 0 0.3 respectively for the dominant A and the recessive A. I'm not going to do this again because I think having done it twice, you all can do it. If you cannot, hey, just tell me. So next up, of course, is where we're going at least as far as what you may not have heard yet, unless you've gotten this far in what I call your, your given lecture. So here it says frequencies of alleles and genotypes in a population, they do not change from generation to generation unless there is influence class from some other factor outside. So if, in fact, class population is in genetic equilibrium, there will be no net change in allelic or genotypic frequencies over time. And in fact, if there is no change in allele frequencies or genotype frequencies, the population class is not, a, not evolving. 
In other words, class, if either the allele frequency changes or the genotype frequency changes, evolution class is occurring. So I won't necessarily go over how this was developed. What I will get to, of course, it was by both Hardy and Weinberg that, of course, mathematically got to the expected frequencies of genotypes that were at equilibrium. And, of course, it's by using those phenotypic frequencies to calculate the expected genotypic frequencies and allelic frequencies in individuals who reproduce sexually. So, in other words, what we'll now get to class are calculating what would be the expected frequency for both genotype and phenotype. Excuse me, genotype and allele frequencies. So, there are two equations for this called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or Hardy-Weinberg principle. So, on your paper, write these out because you will use these throughout the rest of this lecture overview. So, allele frequency, the first of two, is for Hardy-Weinberg, P as in Paul, plus Q as in Queen, equals 1. And again, that is for allele frequency. So P plus Q equals 1 for allele frequency. So P represents the dominant allele, and Q represents the recessive allele. And of course, given one or the other class, as you see it here, given, of course, Q, you can find P. And of course, given P, you can find Q. I.e., if you know either of those two values class, by way of mathematics, you can find the value you do not know. Secondly class, by way of the Hardy-Weinberg principle or equilibrium, we can then class get to those expected genotype frequencies. So the second of two equations class is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. And that is for genotypic frequencies. So I'll write down genotype frequencies or genotype frequency, excuse me. And bear in mind, class, and I'm writing all of this down, I would say just like this. So there we have it. So P squared class would represent homozygous dominant. 2PQ would represent heterozygous. And Q squared would represent homozygous recessive. So let's put this to use. So it states, Hardy-Weinberg calculations can, be, can begin by determining the frequency of homozygous recessive genotype. And I, I said, can begin, I'll make that, they always begin. I'll say it again, class. When calculating these for every problem you ever do, always find Q first. So for every problem you do, for every problem you do, class, I say again, always, always find Q first. So I'm going to write that right here. We always, class, we always find Q, find Q first. And I say if you find Q first, class, well, you should get the answer correct. My period. So here we go. So here in our example of this, it states that 90 homozygous recessive individuals in a population of 1,000. So let's go ahead and find both, of course, allele frequencies, meaning the, the frequency class of the recessive allele, which is, of course, that recessive A, and the frequency class of that dominant allele, which will be that dominant A. First things first, class, we'll write down, I say the first thing we do is write down Q squared, write down Q squared equals 90 divided by 1,000. So I'll pull over the calculator and type it in. So 90 divided by 1,000 equals 0 0.09. So now that you have Q squared, we haven't found Q, you all. So to find Q, we would take the square root of Q squared. So the square root of Q squared 
is 0 0.3. So you can write down now Q equals 0 0.3. Given Q, we can find P using the allele frequency equation. So, of course, 1 minus 0 0.3 equals 0 0.7. So, of course, P equals 0 0.7. So, you've now class calculated the allele frequency for the dominant and recessive allele. And in the event that you were to have to calculate the, the genotype frequencies, let's begin now. So P squared would be 0 0.7 squared. So that would be 0 0.49. And then 2 times P times Q is nothing more than 2 times P, which is 0 0.7, times Q, which is 0 0.3, which is 0 0.42, which I almost forgot. And then lastly, to find, of course, Q squared, it would be simply 0 0.3 squared, which is 0 0.09. And to check your answer class, you have the equation. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. So we have Q squared here. So let's add 2 times P times Q, which was 0 0.42 plus 0 0.49, which was P squared. The answer is 1. So your answer is correct. Let us now continue with the rest of this to get finished. Have the answer class to what we just did. So if you missed anything, it's all right here for you. Reference this as much as you like. And this is how your textbook does it. I have I have not done it in such a way before. But if this does help you, make use of it. And of course, this shows you the very same thing, giving you, of course, what we just did using a planet square. So there are five conditions that must be met class for a population to be in hardy weinberg equilibrium or genetic equilibrium. I won't get to this so much as now because I'll focus class more so on what's in your lab test. But I would say this is theoretical because it says it seldom occurs in the natural world. Well, why? Well, one reason is because there's no natural, no natural selection. And another reason is because writing is man random, of course at least for this condition class, to, of course, mean to be met, to be in equilibrium here. And even class, it says no net mutations, and I'll hush on those. Because I think you now can see why this is theoretical and would seldom occur. Because, of course, those things, class, likely are not going to be met in any population. So let's go to our first of three examples. So in this example, called example one, it states, in a given population of 600 humans on a remote Pacific island, 120 individuals have the phenotype at attached earlobes, which is a recessive genetic trait. So the question asked is, what percentage of the population is homozygous dominant for the trait? So, as I mentioned before class, we find Q first. So, to find Q, you would write down class Q squared equals 120 divided by 600, and that's 120 divided by 600, alright, so that is 0 0.2, and to find Q, given Q squared, you just simply write down class what is called, of course, 0 0.2, and take the square root of that, which you can do just like that. And given that it is 0 0.447, 
Let's go ahead and round this class to the nearest tenth. And I'll say again, always round your allele frequencies to the nearest tenth. So that would be 0 0.5 equals Q. So it asked class, what percentage of the population is homozygous dominant for the trait? What percentage is homozygous dominant for the trait? Well, we don't know because we only have Q. So, of course, to find what is P, P would be 1 minus Q, which is 0 0.5, and the answer class is 0 0.5. So, now, given that we need the percentage of the population that is homozygous dominant for the trait, go back to your equation. We need class what is called p squared, and p squared class is 0 0.25. So it would be 25% of the population is homozygous dominant for the trait. That is the answer. So there you have it. 25% is your answer. Let's move on to our second, second of three examples. So here in example two, in a given population of wild Mustang horses, brown hair is dominant to blonde hair. Within the population of Mustangs, there are 168 brown haired Mustangs out of a total population of 200. It asks now, what is the predicted frequency of heterozygous brown Mustangs? So let's find out. So given that they provided us class with, of course, those Mustangs with brown hair, that is dominant to blonde hair, we must, of course, get to what is called Q squared. So our first step in this problem will be to, of course, determine how many Mustangs had blonde hair. So we would take and subtract from, of course, 200, what is 168. So we have 200 minus 168, which are brown, giving us class 32 blonde. I repeat, giving us 32 blonde haired Mustangs. So this is example two. So again, it's 200 minus 168, <coughs> excuse me, equals 32. So given that we have this number now class of how many Mustangs, have blonde hair, we can now, of course, begin to work the problem out. And I say that because what we're giving class are those that are, of course, brown hair. And that includes class both those that are homozygous dominant as well as heterozygous. So we must do this bit of math first to get to the actual answer. So as I said before, let's now class find Q first. So to find Q, and I'll take this and put this maybe up here in the top left. Q, e Q equals, or at least Q squared equals, 32 divided by 200. Now let's type it on in. Well, it's already there. So 32 divided by 200 equals 0 0.16. And since we have Q squared, let's now take the square root of Q squared to get Q. And that is 0 0.4. So to find P, given Q, it should be 1 minus 0 0.4, so P is 0 0.6. So we were asked what is the predicted frequency of heterozygous brown Mustangs, and that takes us back to our equation for genotype frequencies. So this would be 2 times P times Q, so that would be 2 times 0 0.6 times 0 0.4 and that is wrong because it's not 8.24 8 so let me type it in 2 <clears throat> excuse me times 0 0.6 times 0 0.4, and that gives us 0 
So the answer class is 0 0.48. Is that predicted frequency of heterozygous brown mustangs? <clears throat> Excuse me. And to check your answer class, of course, just type in the rest of which. Meaning, to see if it equals 1. So you type in, of course, p squared, which would be 0 0.6 squared. And then, of course, get what is called q squared, which we already have, and add those two together class, and that should equal 1, giving you, of course, the correct answer. Next up is our third of three examples. And before we get there, this shows you class, the way in which we got to this answer. So the math is done first, meaning 160, well, 200 minus 168 to get 32. And of course, you find, of course, what is called Q squared. I find Q squared, you can find Q, and of course, complete the problem. Here we are, the third example. A researcher working with walking stick insects are interested in the allelic frequency of a particular dollar allele within given population in Baldwin County. They estimate the percentage of the population by the mark recapture method, possessing the recessive trait to be at 64%. The question is now asked, what is the frequency of the dominant allele within the population? So given what we have there, class, for example, three, and I guess I've stopped showing you my work, so I'm still working these out right along with you. With example one being there, or our first example being here, example one being there, example two, there, and the third example class going here. So work this out, please, along with me. Example three. So here, they tell us that the estimated percentage of the population with, of course, the recessive trait to be at 64%. So Q squared class is, in fact, 0 0.64. So the first thing to do, class, is to find Q. So to find Q, you take the square root of 0 0.64. And once we do that, we're given that Q equal, equals 0 0.8. And given Q, we can find P. So it would be 1 minus 0 0.8. And that means P is 0 0.2. So the frequency of the downward allele class is just that, 0 0.2. So I hope that you can do this on your lab test. If you cannot, well, let me know how I can help you before the lab test to ensure that you can. So given those three examples, I'll now class to you, of course, the answer to such as we just did. And of course, P equals 0 0.2. That is, of course, the frequency for that dominant blue. So let's move it along from here, class. So this gets into human genetics class and I do this because the karyotype provides that visual of an individual's chromosomes. So in that class, yes, there are 46 chromosomes in total. However, there are 44 autosomes and being in 22 pairs. And then, of course, the one pair of six chromosomes being, of course, XX or XY. Note, a deviation class from that is, of course, a certain disorder. In a class being an aneuploidy, being off by one chromosome number. And, well, I'll just leave it at that, because we don't have polyploidy class in Homo sapiens, because this is in humans. So it could be class XO, meaning having 45 chromosomes, or in the case of Down syndrome class, having, of course, 47 chromosomes, because it's a trisomy, or a trisomic condition, with, of course, three 21st chromosomes. This class is a karyotype, and here, class, it says this is a normal male. So on your lab test, be prepared, class, to look at a karyotype, and to determine class whether or not there is a disorder that's there. The pedigrees. So, of course, this is that family tree, giving you those inheritance patterns class found over generations. So they can check out and identify to provide class insight into three different modes of a single locus disorder, i.e., an autosomal dominant disorder, an autosomal recessive disorder, or even class X-linked 
recessive disorders. So on your lab test, you represent a class with this. And given this, you'll be asked class whether or not class those disorders are either autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or X-linked recessive. Given, of course, these, of course, three generations we have here in class, you can see that there are two generate, well, excuse me, two individuals affected in the first generation. One female being individual two, and one male being individual individual three. So take your time class to review this. And not just this pedigree, but I mean pedigrees in general. So on to the next part, and this is the final part of what we'll do at least on the lab test, at least as far as this review is concerned, I'd say. The final part of the review as far as the lab test is concerned. So this gets to hypothesis testing because we learned about the hypotheses back in our first chapter, and that was in, in, of course, the first month of the semester and the first lecture. So it allows us to test relative frequencies of outcomes when there are more than two possible outcomes. So for the chi-square statistic, and this is across all n individuals, well, all n observations, but of course the chi-square at n minus 1, and n minus 1 in this case class refers to degrees of freedom. And I'll do that in a moment. But of course you take the sum of the observed minus expected squared divided by expected. So I'll give you class what you need to calculate this. But I say again, it's observed minus expected squared divided by expected, the sum of those to provide us with that chi-squared statistic. And one thing to add to this, since we're going through it, I'll say if in fact class your chi-square, if your chi-square value, if chi-square is greater, if your chi-square value is greater than the critical value, If the chi-square value is greater than the critical value, that then means class you can reject. That means you can reject class the null hypothesis known as H naught. And then of course you could accept one of those alternative hypotheses. So I'll say again, if chi-square is greater than the critical value, if chi-square is greater than the critical value, then of course you reject reject the null hypothesis. And typical of which class is for that null hypothesis to state that there is no difference class, that there is no difference. So as far as the degrees of freedom class, I'll just say as being if there are three categories class, you of course would subtract one because that's the number of times the categories are used. So if there are three categories, you subtract one, so that would be two degrees of freedom. So if there were only two categories, if there are only two categories, two minus one would of course equal one degree of freedom. So I'll help you with this class and give you a lot of information that you don't have to necessarily remember for your lab test. So in calculating the chi-square value class, I'll say pay close attention to this column, that column, and that column. So to calculate the chi-square class, it's right there in your face. You take the observed value minus the expected value. You square that. So observed minus expected squared divided by expected. So I say again, take the observed value minus the expected value. You square that and then divide that by the expected value. And of course, upon taking the sum, upon taking the sum of all of those, you then class have your chi-square value. And I'll show you this in just a moment, class. So with that class, you can compare your chi-square value to the critical value. 
And upon doing that, you can make some determination. For instance, let's get to this smaller example. The smaller example. So chi squared is the sum of, so I'm writing out chi squared equals, literally, let's write down chi squared equals observed minus expected divided by expected and take the sum of those. Let me step back just a bit. So this example class is about, of course, children. You say children? Yes, children. So this is for the number of expectant families. So with all of these families class, they would like to know what is the probability of having a boy given you have no children? What's the probability of having a boy given you have one boy? And what's the probability of having a boy having two boys? And if you look closely class, here, that probability is not different given either of those conditions. So here we go. So it's observed minus expected divided by expected. So let's go. So it's 530 minus 585.3 squared divided by expected, which is 585.3 plus the next of which, which of course is 1,333. I'm sorry, 1,332 minus 1,221.4 squared divided by 1,221.4. And then there is another. So you would add, excuse me, of course, add 582 minus 637.3 squared divided by 637.3. So the chi square value, again, this is you take the sum of these values, which comes from observed minus expected squared divided by expected for each of these. And what we get from those, it's right here, class, on the screen. So I'm helping you with this so you can get this done. And it's not simulating something you cannot do because you can all do this. So the answer class of the first is 5.225. The second class, so of course plus 10.015 plus 4.799. And that provides us class with a chi-square value of 20.038. And if you're wondering how to do this, I'll again tell you it's observed minus expected squared divided by expected. So it would be 530 minus 585.3, enter, squared, and then divided by 585.3, and there's the answer, 5.2248, so you can see where we rounded. Next was 1,332 minus 1,221.4 squared. Not I expected, so it's 1,221.4. And that's where we got 10.015. And then thirdly, it is 582 
minus six hundred thirty-seven point three squared divided by six hundred thirty-seven point three. And that's where we got 4.7985, so it was rounded, of course. Sum class, of course, is just adding those three numbers together to get that number. So let's get to hypothesis testing, because we just have one more step. So given class, chi-square, which is... 20.038, we had those three, I repeat, we had those three categories, so I say three minus one equals two, so of course we have those two degrees of freedom, so our critical value class is 5.991, and keep in mind class that I will give you this chi-square chart, the chi-square table on your test. So, Make the comparison. Is, chi, is, is the chi-square value class greater than or less than the chi-square value? It's most definitely greater than class. So you would reject the hypothesis that, that, that we saw class in the data. That, that we see class, of course. That, of course, if in fact class is a difference, you can say that there is class. Something that work here. Because what we're seeing class is not anything more than we would expect. Because, of course, it does not change that the person will have a boy or a girl class, given the sex of their child, if they even have had a child already. It's all random. So this has been your instructor, Skylar Huff. And if you need any help, please ask. And, of course, I did some writing out and scratching out, but there is what I did here. And on the test, you'll be given the very same, as well as class, and on-screen calculator for all calculations. So if you have any questions, please email me, call me, or even stop by the office with an appointment.